Hey guys, Aaron Farmer here with MySugarFreeJourney.com and just uh, before we get into today's video, I just want to remind you guys, if you like these videos, please say something in the comments. I'd love to hear from you, but most importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel and tell your friends. All right, let's take a look at all of the nutrition stuff that came across my desk today. Journal, this is in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, Modified Ketogenic Diet in Lymphoma, a case study in the Veteran, Veteran Affairs Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Wow. This is such an awesome series of case studies. So um, I'm not sure why all of my notes are no longer highlighted, but um, here's what the, they did. So background, cancer cells preferentially use glucose due to mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm so glad that somebody out there is listening to the work of Dr. Thomas Seafried, uh, because that's not something that that's not something that is considered to be an important part of cancer research. The idea that cancer cells prefer sugar over uh, over you know other uh, not 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 prefer, but they can only use glucose. Uh, there are some things out there that say that they can use ketones. I haven't seen any definitive proof of that yet, but they preferentially cancer cells preferentially use glucose. Ketogenic diets preferentially feed normal cells while starving cancer. There are no human studies on ketogenic diets in lymphoma or leukemia. So basically they took, they had three, uh, three uh, lymphoma patients, put them on a ketogenic diet and went over, you know, what happened to them as a result. So I'm just going to go over the results, uh, but this is an interesting paper. You're probably going to read the whole thing. So first of all, 52 year old male, uh, we'll go over all the stuff that he had, uh, but Dude had some problems. <clears throat> uh, four months later, let's see. Uh, okay, his weight was 255 pounds. Four months later, he lost 22 pounds. This was after being put on the ketogenic diet. His eyeball pain was gone. His arm and back uh, urethma, urethma, hmm, urethma, that's a new word to me, faded. Seven months later, his back was urethma free. 15 months later, at 206 pounds, mind you, a 49 pound uh, weight loss, his eyebrows normalized with mild urethma left over parts of his face. That is a, an overwhelming success uh, for the ketogenic diet. Case number two, 80 year old male. So this is, this is an old man, 80 year old male. Uh, with all kinds of problems. He lost 31 pounds, which was 17% uh, of his baseline. He had bilateral leg edema. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this was, this was I'm sorry, he lost 31 pounds as a result of his cancer, my bad. Uh, we held ke chemotherapy and he started the diet. So they, they preferred the ketogenic diet over chemotherapy. That's, that's a big deal. Um, a week later, he lost 12 more pounds, but he was more energetic and the edema resolved. So he lost 12 more pounds, but had more energy. That's interesting. His weight improved and two months later, he resumed chemotherapy, recovering to baseline weight by one year. Two years later, he is disease free on uh, maintenance rituximab. So this guy, that, for an 80 year old man to see that kind of a turnaround on uh, mostly diet, I mean, it chemotherapy too. But uh, for an 80-year-old man to see that level of improvement, that's a big deal. So case number three, 73-year-old man with malt gastric lymphoma and stage three mantle cell lymphoma had a partial response after six cycles of chemotherapy. He weighed 216 pounds. His BMI was 28.6. He began the, dial, the diet at cycle four. Six months after chemotherapy, he lost 22 pounds and his PET CT scans were cancer free. His PET CT scans at 73 years old were cancer free. He is disease free two years later. That's amazing. Conclusions. The ketogenic diet in human lymphomas appears well tolerated and can improve symptoms, quality of life, and possibly limit tumors. Ketogenic diets may reverse the weight loss seen in terminal cancer patients with cachexia. That is an incredible series of case studies and I'm so glad that the Veteran Affairs Hospital in Pittsburgh, of all places, decided to do that. I don't know who the doctor is that, that decided to do this. We've got a whole list of names up here that none of them, you know, uh, seem familiar to me. Um, but that's that's amazing. I want to see if I can't get a hold of a couple of these people, get them on the podcast, because I want to talk to him. That's, that's incredible. All right. Next up, this was a Vox article, and the only reason I'm improving it, uh, including it, the main reason I'm including it, is because it's a Vox article. So this is 
um, you know, this is a, a this is a pretty big deal. The keto moment, the extreme diet phenomenon, may offer clues on how nutrition can treat disease. So this isn't so much about weight loss, although you know, anytime you're dealing with um, the ketogenic diet, weight loss is going to be in, included. This is more about how it deals with uh, disease. Beyond all the hype, the chance that keto, a minimalist variation on the diet promoted by cardiologist Robert Atkins, can solve the obesity crisis is vanishingly slim. Well, that's too bad. An average low-carb diets look a lot like others when it comes to long-term weight loss. Weight loss, most people don't stick to them. Of course, we know what that's linking to is <clears throat> when you just take random people off the street and try to put them on a ketogenic diet, they don't tend to stick to it. But if you take motivated people who are extremely obese and no longer want to be obese, those people tend to stick to the ketogenic diet because they have a reason to stick to the ketogenic diet. So, uh, you know, these, these studies be damned. If you're out there and you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to improve your health and you would like to figure out a way to do that that is easy um, and, uh, and honestly not very hard to stick to, I just had a whole plate of, of eggs and sausage, uh, that's going to be my lunch. Uh, and, you know, that, that's not a difficult way to eat. I love eggs and sausage. And if you could do that, you can stick to it. I promise. I promise. Um, the diet doesn't just change Wortman's life. So this is someone that they're, uh, they're talking about his personal experience with the diet. It changed how he thought about medicine and nutrition. And the reason I'm including this is because the exact same thing happened to me and the exact same thing will happen to you if you really study the ketogenic diet. He believes that there's a conspiracy by a matrix of agendas to promote a plant-based diet. I wholeheartedly believe that. I wholeheartedly believe that there are forces out there that are bigger than we can understand that are constantly pushing. Most of them are at Harvard for some reason. Most of them are coming out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and their uh, evangelistic uh, efforts to promote the vegan diet. That there is definitely this this conspiracy, we'll call it. I don't like to use the word conspiracy because it makes you sound like a conspiracy nut. But there is definitely this, this conspiracy out there to promote a plant-based diet. And again, I just want to say... For the record, a plant-based vegan diet is better for you than a standard American diet. Anytime you compare the results of a vegan diet uh, against people who are just eating what they would normally eat, their health markers are going to improve because a vegan diet, for all of its you know, problems, is a basically a whole food diet. And that's what human beings were supposed to eat, is a whole food diet. But those poor vegans, they usually don't stay vegans for very long because your body needs fat. So moving on, the whole fiber thing is a myth, he tells me. That's another thing you're probably going to believe. You don't need fiber. In fact, every time that uh, someone with gastrointestinal issues start adding fiber to their diet, their problems don't get worse, uh, don't get better, they get worse. But if you will start removing fiber from your diet, you're going to see a lot of improvement in your gastrointestinal intestinal health. He also thinks the concern about a meat-heavy diet's impact on the planet, that cows produce too much methane, are hugely overblown, and in parentheses it says they aren't, they are, and that the link between cardiovascular disease and saturated fat has been debunked, and in parentheses it says it hasn't, and they're kind of right. It's very difficult to do the studies that look at uh, the effect on saturated fat uh, to cardiovascular disease. But I can tell you um, that the problem with a lot of these studies is they're looking at uh, a raise in LDL cholesterol. And they so they, they're not looking at hard outcomes. They're looking at a raise in LDL cholesterol. And they're saying anything that raises LDL cholesterol will uh, cause more cardiovascular events down the road. And I would agree that if you're eating a standard American diet full of a lot of sugar and a lot of processed grains, anything that raises your LDL is going to be bad for you. However, if you're eating a diet that's high in real fat, the fat that we've been eating since we became human beings, a rise in LDL doesn't seem to be an issue. However, if you're scared of LDL, then eat a diet free of sugar and processed grains and polyunsaturated fats and take a statin if that's what you want to do. I wouldn't recommend it because I don't care about my LDL cholesterol. I only care about things like inflammation and my triglyceride levels and my ratio of triglyceride levels to HDL cholesterol. That, those are the numbers, the hard outcomes that I'm looking at. I don't care what my LDL cholesterol is. But if you want to reduce your LDL cholesterol, there's a, there's a pill that you can take to do it. I don't think it's necessary. I'm not your doctor. Moving on. 
Uh, this is in Science Daily. Obstructive sleep apnea may be one reason depression treatment doesn't work. When someone is depressed and having suicidal thoughts or their depression treatment just isn't working, their caregiver, caregivers might want to check to see if they have obstructive sleep apnea, investigators say. So, I don't want to say there's no such thing as depression because there's obviously people that are depressed. There are obviously people who have uh, problems, uh, you know, with their hormones in their body that cause them to be depressed. I do want to say this. If you are depressed and you're out there and you're watching this video and you're struggling with depression, if you are not eating a diet that's free of the things that we know cause harm, sugar, processed grains, polyunsaturated fats, and anything else in your diet that may cause you individually harm. Some people are, you know, sensitive to eggs. Some people are sensitive to dairy. Some people are sensitive to other things. You know, you're a unique person. There might be some dietary things that you need to look at that you need to remove from your diet. If you're not, so if you're not eating a diet free of those things that we know cause harm, if you're not uh, getting regular exercise, if you're not getting regular exposure to the sun, and if you're not getting good, high quality sleep, like what this study says, you're not giving yourself a fighting chance to get rid of your depression. Depression is terrible. Nobody wants to have it. There are things that you could do to make it better. Once you do those things, you might still have depression and you might have to take certain medication or you might have to get therapy or you might have to get other things. But there are things that you can do that are going to move you really, really far down the line. Uh, towards getting rid of your depression and it's diet, it's exercise, it's sun exposure, it's good high quality sleep and it's being surrounded by people that you love and who love you back. That, I mean, that's, those are the bare minimums that you need to do when dealing with depression. So again, I just want to reiterate, I am not saying there's no such thing as depression because anything, anytime I even get close to saying something like that, I get a hundred comments and emails and everything else. And you know, you, people, People, people fight against the that people do not want you to take away their right to be depressed. Okay, so I'm not taking away your right to be depressed if you're depressed. Okay, but there are things that you can do to make your life better. Moving on. Ketogenic diet induced weight loss is associated with an increase in vitamin D levels in obese patients. <clears throat> Vitamin D is an important micronutrient involved in several processes. Evidence has shown a strong association between vitamin D and cardiometabolic diseases, including obesity. The aim of this study was to investigate the effect of the ketogenic diet induced weight loss on vitamin D status in a population of obese adults. We'll skip down to the end here. The increase in serum uh, vitamin D concentrations were strongly associated with body mass index, waist circumference, and fatty mass variation. In a multiple regression analysis, fatty mass was the strongest independent predictor of vitamin D concentrations. We also observed a greater reduction of inflammation evaluated by uh, HRCRP, uh, HSCRP values and a greater improvement in glucose homeostasis confirmed by a reduction in HOMA values in the very low carb ketogenic diet. So people who ate a very low carb ketogenic diet had increased vitamin C levels or vitamin D levels. So what's going on here? And I, I did a video about this here not too long ago. My theory is the vitamin D levels in your blood are not the the ultimate cause of health. They are approximate or they're the, their approximate result of the other things that you're doing to improve health. People that are on a very low carb ketogenic diet, they tend to lose weight, they tend to have more energy, and people who have reduced weight and more energy tend to go outside and do things. Going outside and doing things exposes your, sin, your skin to the sun, which causes your vitamin D levels to go up. And the reason I think this is every time we supplement with, uh, with vitamin D, we don't see the results uh, of we don't, we don't see as good a results from vitamin D supplement, supplementation as we would think that we would see. But going outside, exposing your skin to the sun, you know, take the necessary steps if you're if you're uh, you know um, if you're uh, partial to getting things like melanoma, you know, you know there there are people out there who are very very fair skin. They can only take you know a certain amount of sun, and it'll cause problems on down the line. Um, but especially eating a diet that's free of the uh, polyunsaturated fats that tend to go bad very, very quickly as they're incorporated into your skin cells. If you're eating a diet high in saturated fat and you're going outside and getting sun, your, your you know, chances of getting things like melanoma are greatly reduced. And 
but more importantly, going outside, you're doing things, you're, you're, you're using your body in the way that it was intended. And those people tend to have better health markers. Of course they are, you know, of course they tend to have better health markers because they're, you know, their health is improving, they're losing weight and they're going outside and getting plenty of exercise. So don't chase after, I guess what I'm saying here is don't chase after vitamin D levels to the point where you're taking supplementation, you know, a vitamin D pill. I mean, I don't have any problem with the vitamin D pill especially for people who live up north or especially for people who, you know, they work all day and so they never really see the sun. We know those people exist. What I am saying is that the vitamin D that actually does good for your body comes from the sun and it comes from you going outside and doing something. Go do something outside. All right, moving on. Mediterranean diet during pregnancy reduces gestational diabetes and weight gain. Um, so they put these uh, pregnant women on a Mediterranean diet. The results show that having a Mediterranean style diet, including 30 grams of mixed nuts per day and extra virgin olive oil led to a 35% lower risk of developing diabetes in pregnancy and an average 1.25 kilogram less weight gain in pregnancy compared to those who receive routine antenatal care. The reason that these people uh, saw better results in a Mediterranean diet is because they were feeding them more real food, mixed nuts, and extra virgin olive oil are more real food, and I'm sure that those, that percentage of real food was crowding out the other things in their diet that was probably doing them harm. So uh, when you go from a standard American diet to a Mediterranean diet, you're taking one step closer to a diet that's full of whole real foods and fat and fat. I cannot stress this enough, especially if you're pregnant. You need plenty of fat. You need to give that baby what it needs to, to grow and to develop its, its body. And 30 grams of mixed nuts per day and extra virgin olive oil are both excellent sources of fat. So of course, they are going to have healthier babies and you're going to have reduced risk of, of diabetes. Sorry. Next up, researchers get a handle on how to control blood sugar after stroke. I thought this was really, really interesting. Hyperglycemia or high levels of glucose is common in patients with acute ischemic stroke and is associated with worse outcomes compared to normal blood sugar levels. Okay. Animal studies also pointed to an effect of high blood sugar of high blood sugar in worsening stroke injury. Stroke experts have debated whether intensive glucose management after acute ischemic strokes leads to better outcomes, but a new study in JAMA finds that aggressive methods are not better than standard approaches. So aggressive methods, methods for lowering blood glucose levels are not better, that's what this study says, uh, than, than the normal methods of reducing blood glucose. Well, let's see how they lowered their blood glucose. This is where it gets interesting. More than 1,100 patients underwent intensive glucose management, which required the use of intravenous delivery of insulin to bring blood sugar levels down to between 80 and 130 milligrams per deciliter. So they're pumping these poor patients full of insulin to get their blood sugar levels down to a normal level. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, it goes over the difference, the different, the other way to do it. After 90 days, the patients were evaluated for outcomes, including disability, neurological function, and quality of life. The results suggested that the two treatments were equally effective, and we should say equally ineffective, at helping the patients lower or uh, recover from their strokes. After 90 days, about 20% of the patients showed favorable outcomes, regardless of whether they were given intensive or standard treatment. Oh my God. Goodness, did these doctors not understand that it's the insulin that's causing the problem? Insulin is an inflammatory hormone. If you're pumping your these stroke patients full of insulin, of course they're not going to do any better than someone who's who's you know got the normal amount of, of blood glucose control. What these sh what these people should have studied is they should have studied a way a way to reduce blood glucose levels and blood insulin levels at the same time. How do you do that? You don't eat a diet that raises your blood glucose levels. You don't eat a diet that raises your blood sugar levels. And uh, you don't eat a diet that requires your body to produce insulin. There's a very simple way to, that, that, that could have been tested. I don't know why they went with injecting these poor patients with insulin. The, of course, there's not going to be any difference. I guarantee you that if they redid this test and put one set of patients on the standard crappy food that comes from the hospital uh, that comes from the hospital cafeteria versus people who are eating whole real foods that don't raise blood sugar levels, lots of steak, lots of hamburger meat, 
maybe the occasional salad or whatever, but of course, you know, real olive oil and real vinegar on the uh, on the salad, nothing with a bunch of polyunsaturated fats. I can almost guarantee you that those patients are going to see much better outcomes. And finally, I ran across this article, A Hypothesis to Explain the Role of Meat Eating in Human Evolution. I include this just because uh, it's one of these interesting things when you're talking to vegans about how they, how we as human beings have all of these structures in our body that say that we are supposed to be vegan or we're supposed to be frugivores and only eat fruit or only eat vegetables. This was interesting. Extant, cape, extant apes or, and humans are descended from a common plant-eating ancestor. Great apes and humans also show similar, similarities to many features of gut anatomy and a similar pattern of digestive kinetics passing ingests at a relatively slow rate. And it goes through the different ways that these apes, as they grew in size, uh, underwent different dietary strategies to try to deal with the fact that they're getting crappy nutrition from all of this plant food um, and uh, you know the, the different ways they developed and then it gets to humans. Humans who are believed to have evolved in a more arid and seasonal uh, environments than did extant apes illustrate a third dietary strategy in the humanoid line. By routinely including am, uh, animal protein in their diet, they were able to reap some nutritional advantages enjoyed by carnivores, carnivores, even though they had features of gut anatomy and digestive kinetics in herbivores. The whole paper is fascinating. I'm going to include a link uh, in the notes for you to go check it out. It's, it's worth reading. But here's the deal. If you ever come across a vegan that points to different structures in our anatomy that says, you know, that, you know, if you just look at that, that means that we're supposed to be vegans, that we're supposed to only eat vegetables, that we're supposed to only eat fruit. Those are the frugivores. Those crazy people out there that believe that. Yes, at one point in time, human beings only ate vegetation. And then we discovered that if we ate meat instead, we got bigger, we got stronger, we got faster, but most importantly, we got smarter. Our brain was the key evolutionary advantage that human beings have over every other planet that's on, or every other animal that's on the planet. Eating fat fed our brains. Eating fat led to our brain size develop, uh, it, doubling in size over the course of about two million years. We don't understand everything that went on during that time, but we do know that eating meat was a key part of our evolution. You are pretty much the same type of person as that person, you know, a million years ago, as that, that you know, evolved ape two million years ago, whatever. Can you eat plants? Yes. Can you eat fruit? Yes. Are you supposed to eat only plants or only fruit? No. You are supposed to eat fat. You are supposed to eat meat. That's what you evolved to eat, and that's the diet that made you human. Anyway, check it out. All right, so again, here at the end, give this video a thumbs up. Say something in the comments. I love talking to you guys. Anything that you want to say, uh, unless, you, <laughs> unless you're going to take me to task over saying that depression wasn't real. I didn't say that. Um, and uh, please give this video a like, a thumbs up, share it with your friends, all that good stuff. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back later with another fantastic video. Bye-bye. Except I don't know how to turn it off. There it is.